as a school of public health, shall we tackle obesity? And as you know, you know, obesity, it's going to be a difficult issue to tackle. Right? There's an issue of stigmatization. Um, there's an issue of um, whether or not it can cause adverse outcomes in a sense. And actually, it did in Singapore. There was a program with school children. And they call it the um, TAF program, TAF, TAF. Uh, trim and fit or something like that. Okay. Whereby during recess, instead of the children going, the obese children going for their regular recess, they have to go and perform extra exercise. Okay. And as a result, there's tremendous pressure on these children and a lot of them develop subsequently eating disorders and so forth. And there was a study that conducted and showed that that program you know, should be scrapped. Okay. The other issue is, can obesity become the new normal once you get many people or a large proportion of the population becoming obese? Okay. Say for example, in Singapore, we have about 80% of the population who are myopic. So 80% of the population are myopic, they are wearing glasses or wearing contact lenses. I'm the mutant. You know, I belong to the 20% who doesn't need the, any eye aid. Okay? So what is normal? Actually, the normal is are those who are wearing glasses. You know, I'm the abnormal one. And over time, will obesity become that? You know, when we have, say, 60% of the population, 70% of the population becoming obese, will, will mentally people begin to think that actually obesity is the new normal? So we decided that obesity is a tricky you know, topic to, to tackle. Let's tackle something that is more clear-cut. So we decided to tackle diabetes, and in particular type 2 diabetes. And as you know, type 2 diabetes damages the small blood vessels. And there are horror stories. Being a medical doctor, I can go up on stage and tell horror stories. Uh, one horror story was uh, that I still remember when I was a young medical doctor, a man came in, he was wearing just sandals, and one foot was swollen, badly swollen, and, but he was walking in perfectly fine, just slight limp. Ask him what was his occupation, because I was interested in occupational medicine, and he says, oh, I'm an odd job laborer working in the construction industry. Were you a diabetic? Yes, I was uh, diagnosed as a diabetic about 10 or 15 years ago. Were you on medication? Nah too troublesome okay, and too costly. So for 10 to 15 years, he was known diabetic without any treatment. When I examined him, the food was dusky, you know, it was a bit gangrenous, there was a bit of a foul smell. Took off his sandal, looked under his foot, there was a thumbtack stuck at the bottom of his foot. Okay. And he was walking around not realizing it because damage to the small blood vessels essentially knocks off all the nerves. He doesn't feel any pain. Okay? The wound doesn't heal. It gets infected because the blood supply is poor. All I could do for him is we end up amputating him. Starting off with amputation at the ankle. Right? Again, it doesn't heal. The stump doesn't heal. It goes further up, below the knee. It doesn't heal, goes above the knee. And once above the knee, that's the last amputation I can do. Okay? What, what else can I do? Right? You want me to disarticulate the whole hip? Right? And essentially, he will die from a septicemia, a blood infection, as a result of uh, poor healing. Right? And of course, we have all the other complications that are associated uh, with diabetes. So we felt that diabetes would be one big message, or one big uh, disease that we can actually uh, uh, tackle at the national level. How do you prevent diabetes at the national level? So we started off with projection. The traditional way of projecting um, the burden of a disease is you have age, sex, race, either prevalence rate or incidence rates. And then you do regression, make it a bit more sexy, quadratic equation. Right? And then, the, yeah, this would be the burden. So we did that. 
And then we found that this is not going to be the real problem because you are only taking age, sex, and race. We have an obesity problem. You need to bring in obesity, the increasing rates of obesity, and see what happens. So to do that, using a group-based approach is going to be quite tricky. So we did what we call an agent-based approach. And essentially, what we are projecting is that we will have half a million diabetic in Singapore by 2020. Whatever we do today is too late. We told, them, we, we told the policymakers we are guaranteed to have half a million diabetics by 2020. And that's in a population of about 3 to 4 million people. Right? And by 2050, we will have 1 million diabetics in Singapore. So communicating across the, the burden in terms of diabetes in Singapore was, was one challenge. We got our um, most uh, highly, highly cited uh, publication in Singapore, that's our newspaper, The Straits Times, um, to report for us. Um, that by 2050, we'll have 1 million diabetics. And then to communicate to um, um, non-medical people, to communicate to funders, um, you know, philanthropists, to, to have um, money for diabetes prevention research, we basically translate the message that our children and grandchildren will be the diabetics of the future. And essentially, that's what happened will happen. In 2050, if we are going to have 1 million diabetics, those will be our children and our grandchildren. Okay? Or the students, in this case, you, if you, are, if you happen to be in Singapore. Okay? To communicate with employers, we change the, the tag and basically talk about the number of diabetics in the working population. And this population pyramid shows Singapore population shaped very much like an apple. The black and the grey region are basically the diabetics uh, in Singapore and we are basically rotten to the core. Okay? Even in the 2010, the number of diabetics uh, in Singapore is, is fairly large. And the worst thing is that we have about 180,000 diabetics in the working population and it costs us $1 billion. Not just in terms of um, direct medical costs, but more from loss in terms of productivity, presenteeism in the workplace. Okay? A total cost of $1 billion just from 180,000 diabetics in the workplace. The other frightening thing is that the number of diabetics in the younger age group has been increasing dramatically. When I was a student, to see a diabetic below 50 years of age is a rarity. Okay. Today, if you go into the wards in Singapore, diabetics of less than 30 years of age are dime a dozen. We are increasing our retirement age. When I first joined the university, I was told that I'll retire at 55. I'm now 57. <laughs> I'm still not retired. They say that uh, my retirement has been extended to 65. Okay. I got a feeling by the time I'm reaching uh, 65, <laughs> they'll say that it'll be 67. So increasingly, the number of diabetics in the working population is going to increase dramatically. And the cost of doing business is going to be high in Singapore. Right? Because in the past, the employers will not bother about all these chronic diseases because by that time, the workers get these uh, chronic diseases, they have retired. Now they have to live with all these um, workers with chronic diseases. So one of the contributions as a result of this work that we have done in the first two years was to push for a healthy um, living um, uh, program in Singapore and the government put on this healthy living master plan and essentially got hold of several uh, different government ministries together and we contributed to this uh, development of the uh, Healthy Living Master Plan. The other area that we worked on was to highlight that the workplace needs to be a place whereby health promotion has to take place. Right? But unfortunately, this was very, very difficult. And 
Part of the reason is because at the level of the government, there were two different departments. One, a de department of labor that looks after accidents, looks after occupational diseases, and then the department of health looking after general diseases and looking after areas of uh, well-being. At the employer level, they are very concerned in terms of accidents because there is direct impact on the bottom line. They are concerned about occupational diseases because a lot of these are legislated in terms of the prevention. General diseases, fine, I'll just have a doctor you know, uh, where I can refer the workers to. Well-being, well, HR function. Right? And uh, we'll just have a well-being talk once a year. Right? For the workers, of course accidents is a big concern. And they're concerned if whether I could get my medical certificate when I fought you. Right? Well-being, well, once a year I get uh, to attend a one-hour talk in an air-conditioned room. You know, and a nice break from work. How do we bring everything together to have a holistic approach towards workplace safety and health, we basically need a new model of care for the working population where it looks at both health protection and health promotion. So we did a study to try to push for this uh, concept and of uh, total workplace safety and health whereby essentially we evaluated about 30 companies and then came up with this model that you must have a management system that integrates all this and not just um, looking at different departments, looking at different areas. You must have risk-based uh, programs identifying not just safety risk, occupational health risk, but also general diseases risk. And then you must have programs that uh, addresses that. And at a national level, we need to make sure that there's capacity building to ensure that there are the right number of people to be able to do all this. So we proposed this to the government and uh, earlier this year there was a budget debate on this program and finally it was uh, approved. And so now in Singapore this will be rolled out at the national level and our role now is to help in terms of capacity building as well as to go in and evaluate uh, some of these programs. So what's the next big thing that we hope to do? in, the, in the, our School of Public Health. We hope now to be able to implement the Healthy Living Master Plan as well as total workplace safety and health within our campus and to use our campus as a model to be able to have National University of Singapore as a healthy and safe campus. And essentially is to make the general environment conducive for healthy living but at the same time, make the personal environment steer us towards healthy living. And because the National University of Singapore is a comprehensive university, ranging from engineering, humanities, and so forth, I think all the research work has already been done. The research findings are there. The issue is how can these research findings be translated? How can we evaluate its impact? How can we evaluate its cost effectiveness? and how can it be scaled up and sustained. Right? Now, a lot of these questions appear to be operational questions, but actually, we, I don't think that this is just operational issues, that these questions require academic input. And that's what we hope to be able to achieve by having all our programs centered around NUS, a healthy and safe campus. So some example. You don't see this in Singapore, if you come to NUS. You can't cycle. It's dangerous to cycle. Okay? So there are lots of cars within the campus. It's absolutely unsafe to cycle. It's absolutely not very conducive uh, to walk because it's hot, it's humid. Humidity is between good days, 92%, <laughs> bad days, 99%. Right? So it's hot and humid all year round. Right? So can we make our campus physical infrastructure make changes in terms of uh, the roads to change it into cycling tracks, to have walking paths that are covered? Right? 
Currently, our walking paths are covered, but they are only about three men's width. And in Singapore, we have what I call horizontal rain. When it rains, it doesn't come down this way, it comes down sideways. Right? And even the centre person under the, under the shade, under the covered walkway, will get wet. We need to expand that covered walkway to be 10 men width, so that when it rains, at least four can still walk. Okay? <laughs> And because it is of that kind of nature, we could actually have solar panels at the top and actually have water mist along the side, for example, to cool it down further. Okay. So, so all those are possibilities. Change the roads instead of car, have golf trucks, buggies <laughs> for the handicapped and old professors. <laughs> In terms of the physical environment, Instead of now, it's a stairs or lift environment. When you walk into the campus, the first thing you see is the lift. Can we change that? Right? Um, can lifts operate only from the third floors up? So everybody is forced to walk for the first three floors. Right? I don't expect you to climb 10 floors. Right? But first three flights, then you can take the, the lift. Again, unless you are an uh, old professor and, uh, or a handicap, then you have a special pass that you can take the lift from the ground floor up. Right? Food is the other issue. Right? So sodas, for example, vending machines, you know, we all know how, how effective they can be in terms of health promotion. Um, but in Singapore, we have also a lot of unhealthy local food. So this uh, deep fried dough sticks, they are lovely. <laughs> they are <delicious. laughs> right? it, it, it's, it's better than deep fried mass bar. <laughs> right? okay. You see this in the hospital oh. canteen. Right? So we have uh, Burger King in the hospital canteen. We have deep fried dough sticks right? in, the, in the hospital canteens. And then how about making the personal environment steer us towards uh, healthy living? Right. Well, imagine a day not in a not too distant future where our wearables will not just be providing us information, but it actually provides us with advice. It actually helps us as a decision support system, as well as be able to cause behavior change. Now, that can happen very soon. Right. The technology is there. Unfortunately, the data is not there. So what we need is actually to be able to provide individual-based risk information. And we, we think our agent-based micro-simulation uh, model can work. And essentially, the starting point is all the available data that we have in Singapore, all the available data in the literature, we basically decompose them into you know, thousands and thousands of uh, tables look for relationships between them, fed them into this um, micro-simulation model, and essentially we came up with virtual copies of the Singapore population. Okay. So it's actually just coming up with, um, it, it's you know, deconstructing all those tables of information into virtual copies of the Singapore population. And if I'm to subscribe to this, essentially what happens is that it will identify me, or copies of me, in all these virtual populations, and age these virtual copies of me, and be able to provide personalized risk prediction, constantly giving me the personalized advice, and revise that personalized uh, risk prediction as I change my behavior. So one example is, it can be telling me, at the rate you're going, and being a Chinese, hiding all my fat inside, you will become a diabetic by the time you reach 60 years of age. If I change my behavior, aha, you have pushed that now to 65. Right? And if you continue on it, you have pushed it now to 67. If you slacken, it's coming back down to 62, right? and so forth. So it becomes almost like a personal game right? that I essentially challenge myself. It's actually like golf. 
So what I've highlighted to, to you is that a lot of this work requires work across different disciplines and we are very familiar with, team, with terms like multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary. But I think there's now a new uh, sexy term called transdisciplinary. Right? Uh, essentially, that there is greater degree of integration across discipline, greater emphasis on translation, and greater emphasis on stakeholders and end users engagement right from the beginning to ensure that what we uh, translate becomes sustainable. And that's what the direction that the school is trying to take to become in, more involved with different disciplines and move perhaps more and more towards transdisciplinary kind of work. So our vision is that we want to be able to be integrating knowledge across different disciplines to be able to improve the health. It has to then translate in terms of the way we teach, the way we do research, and the way we interact with the region. Okay? So that's the mission of our school and as well as the strategy that we're taking. And we need to rethink the way we train our students. I think when we train public health leaders, we tend to train them like the way we train specialist athletes. They end up a sprinter, they end up a long distance runner, they end up a swimmer. You know, so they specialize in occupational medicine, they specialize in global health, they specialize in health policy and management, right? or they specialize as the epidemiologist or biostatistician. Moving forward, perhaps we should change our way of thinking, our way of training, that a public health leader is actually a triathlete. Right? That we need them to be jack of all trades and master of some that they need to be good in several areas. They may not be the best in each of these areas, but they are best in the combination of those areas. So at the end of the day, the image that I want you to leave uh, today is you are a triathlete. Thank you. Thanks so much, and, and we have time for a few questions or comments. Mm. Oh, um, hi. Um, so I'm just kind of curious about, because I, I like, um, I was really interested in when you talk about the bicycle situation in the uh, NSU campus, so I'm just wondering, uh, is it like, is it an uh, open campus or is it a closed campus? Um, open campus, so open campus as in like uh, outside car traffic can go in. Yeah, I mean it is open to the outside traffic, okay. but um, you know it is still a, a lot of it is uh, still within university kind of uh, traffic. Uh, car ownership in Singapore is very very high. Uh -huh. right? So the, so for example, if I'm to go to um, um, see my university president, um, I it, it's probably just half a kilometer walk but I'll drive, oh. yeah, because by the time I reach there, I'll be all drenched, <laughs> okay, and he won't want to sit next to me. <laughs> okay. Or if after my meeting, there may be a sudden downpour, uh -huh. and I'll be stuck in his office. Oh. Okay. So the, the physical environment is not conducive you know, for, for me to walk. But if you have covered walkways, you, know, you make it cooler, yeah, I mean, most people would walk. So firstly, we have opened it up now for, for all uh, disciplines. Um, then secondly, although they, they do major in certain uh, disciplines, um, so say healthcare uh, policy and so forth, um, in the first uh, six to nine months, the classes are all combined classes. But so much pushback from industry, from other people, <coughs> This action is a job killer. This one is going to put people uh, out of work. This one is too expensive. Uh, we have to raise taxes. So how do you, now Singapore has the advantage of being a, a closer, smaller community. 
Do you have more success than we in terms of uh, putting implementing programs? Um, even though it's smaller, it's more compact, we have exactly the same challenges. Um, we may get uh, better political buy-in and therefore may make uh, things slightly easier. But increasingly, having a political buy-in may be a curse rather than a blessing. In the past, it has been a blessing. Now, increasingly, with the, the electorate, uh, it's slowly becoming a curse. Okay. Um, so it is actually getting more difficult. Um, the, you, you have to start learning now, uh, for, for those of us in, in public health, to start learning to speak the, the language of the um, employers, to, to start talking about um, dollars and cents. Um, to start talking about um, you know, social responsibility and, and, and all that, which we academics were not used to, to doing that in the past. Okay. So it is challenging. It's just as challenging. I'm curious, to, and, and I'm going to think a lot about this internal fat versus the external fat um, when I go over there, because we do look at the Asian populations and they, they seem less fat. You know, So it's a really provocative, interesting idea. But because of the comparison to the Caucasian looking fat, do, do you find you're having a really hard time educating and getting people to believe yeah. that this is a problem? Because we don't have to look far and realize, oh, I wish I didn't have this around my belly, right? But I would think that a lot of people think you're maybe just yelling that the sky is falling and no one really believes you. Yeah. So, so that's why I think the other point I'm trying to make is that um, we need to be very creative in the way we communicate. Yeah. Yeah. And the best way is to actually talk to your end users and, and find out what exactly, um, um, in a sense, frightens them. So obesity doesn't frighten them because this is not a problem. Diabetes frightens them. Um. Okay? Because Singaporeans love to eat. Okay? And to them, diabetes means I cannot eat whatever I want. So I decided not to, not to play the obesity card. Okay? So I took out my diabetes card. <laughs> okay? and, and, and tell them horror stories and show them horror pictures. Okay? And, and in a sense, that uh, catches their attention. And, and that catches the, the attention of the, of the policy makers. Um, there, there was a big movement um, where they were trying to push for obesity as, as, the, as the campaign. And uh, very little buy-in, both from the politicians as well as from the public. Then I, I think what kind of uh, pushed them was this diabetes story that we will have one million diabetics in Singapore in 2050. You know, whatever you do today, we're going to have half a million diabetics in 2020. <coughs> Um, that kind of got their attention. And then they also tell them that they have to work longer and they don't get to retire, making it personal in ways that hurt. And it's really... It's well, a, a, a lot of them actually wants to work longer, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so the, because one, one, of the, one of the big concerns that, that uh, a lot of uh, Singaporeans have is that um, when I stop work, um, do I have enough? To, to sustain me, okay? because we don't have a pension scheme now and so forth. Okay? So, so they, they want to keep working. Okay? And now because of the low fertility rate, you cannot expect your children to be looking after you. Okay? In the past, it is always a kind of a norm for us to be looking after our parents. Yeah? But like uh, my parents, there are 10 of us who look after them. For me, I only have one son. I cannot expect my son to be looking after me. So please join me in thanking Thanks. Dean Chia so much. Thank you.